Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his master, the donkey his owner's manger, but Israel does not know my people do not understand. A oh, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole head is injured, your whole heart afflicted. From the sole of your foot to the top of your head, there is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate. Your city is burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you, laid waste as when overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty has left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Amen. Let's pray, please. Father, mighty God, thank you for this, your holy word, and thank you for this message, and thank you for these people. We pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be here so strongly, Lord, that we cannot deny you. Lord, that we have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. What else can we do? What else can we do? For it is in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Hallelujah. God and people. Isaiah began his book, and he will end it in Isaiah 66, 24, by recounting very realistically, I may say, the response, the response of Judah to God's, Yahweh's favor and his purpose. He will also encounter God's reaction to the, to the human refusal to respond to his favor and his purpose. We ourselves are just like Israel. Israel, God's own people, had forsaken the Lord, and as a result, they were spiritually and morally ill. They were sick. They had rebelled and deserted the Lord and there were consequences for such ungrateful attitude and disrespectful actions on their part. This world, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, this world will suffer the consequences of rebelling against God. There's no way around it. God has blessed mankind and he has continually called us to himself since sin entered into the world and one day though it will come to an end. Isaiah's details here, Judah's situation in God's sight and caused them to return to a covenant relationship with God. God is calling us He's calling you, he's calling me, he's calling all of us. But someday that calling is going to come to an end. What a tragedy. A tragedy indeed. What a tragedy. In verses 2 and 3 of our text, we have the tragedy of rebellious children. Listen, O heavens. Listen, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not 
understand. You know what? No nation in history, in human history, had experienced so many acts of God's mercy and kindness and blessings as Israel had. I dare you, look it up. Try, go to history books. No, you don't have to just look at the Bible. Look at all of history, all of it. And you'll see the acts of God on behalf of Israel uh, far outnumber the acts of love and kindness and forgiveness. Israel was being truly blessed by God. God had found the nation in bondage and delivered that nation from the Egyptian taskmasters. God had made a covenant with Israel. He blessed them. He made them his people. And he was their God. He'd given Israel a land flowing with milk and honey. He fought their battles for them. He blessed them over and over and over. Through these continuous acts of kindness and mercy, God made a great and exalted nation of Israel. He had high hopes of them to worship him and be a witness to the rest of the world. They were to be his people, and they were to be used to bring the rest of the world to him. But despite his benefits, and without the least expression of gratitude, both Israel and Judah had rebelled against God Almighty Yahweh. In our text, heaven and earth were called to witness God's indictment. God calls them children. And I want you to note that this is a very personal intensity. When God calls them his children, that's a special thing. He raised them. Verse 2 gets to the heart of the crisis. God's family, his own children, had broken with him. They had rebelled against him. Judah's rebellion was not simply the rebellion of a nation against a God. No, it was a rebellion against their father, a father, the father. Their reaction was most unreasonable. Unreasonable. In fact, today I wonder why people rebel against God. Their rebellion, their sinfulness, their turning from God, their turning from the morality of God, it's not reasonable. It has no reason behind it. Except for people just don't want to believe in God. In fact, Isaiah said that the domesticated ox and donkey who lacked the capacity to have any reason they demonstrated a greater sense of acknowledgement or appreciation than even his children did Israel did not acknowledge or appreciate their God an ox is unusually submissive to its owner you ever notice that how big and strong oxes are but a domesticated ox is very gentle. It's their attitude. It's their heart. They're big and strong. You'd think an ox is big and strong as they are. Why, they could do just about anything they wanted to because they are, they are very big. They are very strong. But a domesticated ox is very submissive to its owner and very dependent on its owners for subsistence. In Bible times, a donkey was known for its stupidity. Well, what's it known for today? For its stupidity. Like the ox and the donkey, Israel had a master upon whom she de was dependent and to whom she owed obedience. But unlike them, they would not recognize and would not serve their rightful sovereign God and not acknowledge his kindness and love. Therefore, to say that Israel was less knowledgeable than these domesticated animals was a very strong statement that Israel, the people, you know what they were? They were stupid. I'm sorry, but we're pretty stupid too sometimes. These animals 
are more aware of their owners and the source of subsistence from their owners than God's people were. The owner's manger was a feeding trough for the animals. They knew where to go. They knew where to get food. Through the years, I've noticed that sometimes animals do sometimes seem to have more sense than some people. Have you ever noticed that? It seems like some animals are just smarter than human beings because, well, not all human beings, but some human beings, it's pretty easy to be smarter than. Some animals also seem to be more kind toward each other than human beings are to each other. It's the truth. Because of their alertness, I believe, to the natural phenomena, some animals have at times actually helped us, the human beings, helped us to avoid disasters. In North, uh, this is actual true statements, true facts. In northeastern China, officials were able to warn and actually evacuate people from a high-risk area just hours before a major earthquake struck because of the way the animals were acting. They were alerted to the disaster because the cattle were just mooing and mooing and wouldn't stop. And the chickens, they wouldn't even go to roost. They knew something was about to happen. They knew. God gave them the wisdom to understand that. In Japan, 20 small earthquakes within a few months were actually forecast because people noticed that the catfish were swarming frantically like they were being chased by sharks, but there was no sharks. You see, God's given animals, sometimes they have a better understanding of nature and God than we do. And we can use some of their intelligence. From the prophet Isaiah, we learn that observing animals can even teach us how to prevent a ruined life. He noted that an ox knows its owner and a donkey knows where its food comes from. And many human beings have no idea who owns them or where their food comes from. They think it's because of their hard work. They think it's because they're smart and their education. They think they deserve it. But you see, these animals, these animals know who takes care of them. They know. God's people, however, often aren't smart enough to remember their creator, their owner. Hundreds of years after Isaiah, the apostle Paul reminded the Corinthian Christians that they were not their own. They had been bought with a price and they were to honor God in all that they said and all that they did. He says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Take a lesson. Take a lesson from the animals and remember who your owner is and who provides to you. Live wholeheartedly for him. Live so that others know to whom you belong. Israel did not know God or even realize that he was their provider. By being rebellious, the nation failed to carry out God's commands, which provide, proved that they did not really understand God. Because if they truly understood God, they would have obeyed God. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, we don't understand God many times simply because we don't obey Him. In other words, had Judah stopped to consider her origin and God's province, Yahweh's province, she would have been forced to, in a sense of acknowledgement and dependence that is expressed at least by animals. But human beings, to us it's a humbling thing and many people are not willing to humble themselves before God. We see, Israel, she refused to acknowledge God's blessings and a right to be their leader. By her actions, she denied Yahweh's purposes. The Lord's people had broken covenant with Almighty God. 
Brothers and sisters, that is a tragedy. It's a terrible tragedy. So there's a result. We have the result here of denying Yahweh in verses 4 through 9 of our text. Look at Isaiah 1, 4 through 9, and follow along as I read them again, please. Ah, sinful nation, a people loaded with guilt, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Why? Why should you be beaten anymore? Why do you persist in rebellion? Your whole heart is, your whole head is injured. Your whole heart afflicted from the sole of your foot to the top of your head. There is no soundness, only wounds and welts and open sores, not cleansed or bandaged or soothed with oil. Your country is desolate. Your city is burned with fire. Your fields are being stripped by foreigners right before you. Laid waste is when overthrown by strangers. The daughter of Zion is left like a shelter in a vineyard, like a hut in a field of melons, like a city under siege. Unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. You see, Judah's denials of Yahweh has led the people into sin. They followed the path to sin, and they missed the mark that God had set for them. They had missed God's goal for his people. They were doing evil, especially with others. They were dealing corruptly with each other. These reactions reveal that the nation had not just neutrally ignored Yahweh. It appears that Israel had actually actively forsaken Yahweh for their own wicked practices. This should sound familiar to you. In doing so, the people had spurned or abandoned God. In choosing their sinful ways, they had spurned the only hope they had. The only hope. The rebellion was seen in that they had turned away. They actually went backwards. Rather than moving toward God, they were moving away from Him and an unbelievable risk. They were deliberately defiant. They had an attitude of defiance against God, and it's indicated by the words forsaken, spurned, and turned their backs. It wasn't just they wasn't obeying God. They were actually spurning God. The title here, the Holy One of Israel, is used by Isaiah 25 times, and it's almost peculiar to Isaiah because it's only found twice in other places in the Bible. The title appropriately contrasts the people's sin with God's holiness. No people chosen redeemed or otherwise, can flaunt themselves in the face of a gracious God of Israel with impunity. When the covenant people turned their backs on God, there had to be consequences. And there was consequences. The very choice of sin over the will of God must result in retribution. Isaiah recounted what was happening to them to help them understand that their difficult times had become had come because of their disobedience. They were suffering because they had turned from God. They were suffering and hurting and in pain because of their disobedience to God. The picture in verses 5 and 6 is not of a sick man, these whelps here, but someone had flogged. This is a picture of someone who has been beaten, someone who has been flogged within an inch of their life, and yet you know what they're saying? Give me more. Give me more hits. 
The first part of verse 5 makes this point. And the symptoms of verse 6 are those of inflicted injuries, wounds, welts, and open sores. These are figures that Isaiah uses to depict her, her tragic affliction of Israel. Her wounds and bruises had not been bound up or treated. You see, she continued in her desperate condition. She didn't even stop to try to take care of her wounds. She continued to do. No one remedy has been applied to this languishing population. The nation of Israel as a whole was in terrible trouble. Our country, the United States of America, is also in trouble. And no one group seems able to completely able to deal with our problems. Everybody thinks they have the answer, but there is no one group out there that has the answer. I don't care what you call them, whether you call them socialists, Democrats, Republicans, or the whatever, independents, whatever you want to call them. No one group has the answers. We are battling a drug war and we're losing. We have been for how many years now? As long as I can remember. We're not educating our children properly in science and math and especially morally. We're not teaching our children how to be moral people. Our prisons are overcrowded. People think they're privileged and people deserve to take care of them. Pockets of poverty are growing. The list could go on and on. I could talk all day about the problems that this nation has. Isaiah described the problems of ancient Judah and called them wounds. He saw them rooted in a nation's rejection of God. Can the root of our problems be the same? Yes, it is. And just like Israel, our only hope is to return to God. That's our only hope, brothers and sisters. I don't care who we elect in any position as a politician. I don't care who our leaders are. Our only hope is God. We need to pray for our nation. And we need to pray for our leaders that they would return to God and live by standards that is rooted in the nature of God. Verses 7 and 8 indicate that the country had been brought to these tragic conditions by Yahweh sending enemies against her because of her rebellion and sin. Your land is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your fields stripped by foreigners right before you. The tragic reality of their situation is seen in verses 7 and 8. Though these untreated wounds and welts and open sores characterize the nation's spiritual condition, is what it really re reflects is their spiritual condition. Isaiah is also, though, speaking of their condition mil militarily and as a nation. The land of Judah had been trampled under foreign hordes, and, and only at this time, only Jerusalem, only, only Zion was left standing. It's the only thing that was left was Jerusalem. In Isaiah's time, in his lifetime, Judah was surrounded by countries that continued to attack them. They were under constant attack. They should have woke up. They should have woke up and they should have realized these, these terrible problems had become because of their spiritual condition. Isaiah pictured Jerusalem's as inhabitants as being like a, a shelter in a vineyard or a, a hut in a melon field. Did you catch that? Think about that for a second. These huts are temporary structures. They're built to give shade from the sun to the people who are out there guarding the crops, guarding against thieves and animals that would destroy their crops. But these huts are usually alone, easily attacked, and hard to defend because there's nothing there. 
Verse 9 says, unless the Lord Almighty had left us some survivors, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been like Gomorrah. We know that Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities that God completely destroyed because they were really good people, right? <laughs> no, it's because they were wicked. They were sinful. They rebelled against God. God destroyed them. They are examples of God's judgment against sin. Think about that for a second. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sin. So much for a glorious Zion. It was within an inch of being wiped out like Sodom and Gomorrah. Judah would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah, totally devastated if it had not been for God's grace and God's love and leaving some survivors. Some survivors left by God because they were faithful to God. The sparing of the few is the first hint of the remnant. That is the hint of the remnant, brothers and sisters. God will always have a people for himself. We may be few. God will take care of his. We may die. We may be destroyed. But God will take care of his. Hallelujah. We may not even understand it. We may not realize it. But God will take care of his. You know, we live in a sinful world and we ourselves are sinners. God is ours and we are His. This is the remnant of survivors. In conclusion, by their actions, God's people had broken their moral and spiritual covenant with God. By their actions. By breaking their agreement, they were bringing God's judgment upon themselves. Don't you dare blame God. Don't you dare think that God was being evil. Because this one, these people deserve much more than they, God gave them. Uh, had much more punishment than God gave them. In fact, they didn't deserve the mercy and the grace that he had already showed them. God had given them prosperity. But they refused to acknowledge that this prosperity came from him. They thought it was because they were powerful. They were rich. They were wise. But it came from God. God then sent warnings. He sent prophets. But they refused to listen to God. Finally, God brought the fire of his judgment upon Israel. His children. I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, I know this broke God's heart to do so. But if he is a just God and a faithful God, he must do it. He must do it. As long as the people of Judah continued to sin, they cut themselves off from God's help. They isolated themselves from God. When you feel lonely and you feel separated from God, remember this, God does not abandon you. You abandon God. Our sins cut us off from God. He still loves us. He still cares for us. He's still with us. The only sure cure for a loneliness and to restore, it is to restore a respectable a relationship with God by confessing your sin and accepting Jesus and obeying his instructions and communicating with him regularly. That's the only answer. Though the people had turned their backs on God, in the future, he will turn his back on Israel's sin 
Because he will provide a way. Hallelujah. We know what that way is. God will turn his back from our sin. Because Jesus took our sin. Let us pray.